Hi everybody. In today's lecture, I'd like to talk to you about the multiplicity of an ideal gas. But before I get into any of that, um, I want to talk about a couple of other things first so you can understand the derivation that I'm about to do. Now, in higher level physics classes, you'll occasionally see these derivations where authors refer to momentum space. So you might be thinking, what the heck is that? Okay. So let's imagine that we're trying to define an energy, and that energy is the sum of some kinetic plus potential energy. So the kinetic energy is the function of the momentum, right? Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, the mass times the velocity squared, which could be written as p squared over 2m, the momentum squared p divided by 2 times the mass, right? And so the kinetic energy is a function of the momentum. The potential energy would be a function of the position of some sort, and this is really common. But now let's take ourselves to a three-dimensional problem. So the potential energy is described in terms of the x, y, and z coordinates, and this is position space, and we're familiar with position space because we live in it. But kinetic energy is described in terms of the x, y, and z components of the momentum, which is a vector. So the x, y, and z components of the momentum could be thought of as momentum space, okay? So you can actually blame linear algebra if you want to for all of this, <laughs> because both the position and the momentum are 3D vectors, right? Um, and so momentum space, it gets its own coordinate system. So if a particle has kinetic energy that's p squared over 2m, that means p total squared over 2m, right? And the magnitude of a vector is the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So p squared would actually be px squared plus py squared plus bz squared. And then, of course, you would divide that by 2m. And that's the magnitude or the kinetic energy. So that would make a sphere in momentum space, right? Because if you're trying to make a sphere in regular space, right, position space, then your radius squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared is your equation. That's your sphere, right? Okay, now, of course, your sphere in momentum space will always have a thickness. And this is because if you think about what's going on, say, with an ideal gas, where you have uh, molecules zinging around in lots of directions, of course, all of those molecules are not going exactly the same speed, okay? Um, there's a distribution of speeds. And so the uh, value of the momentum isn't going to be a set value and all of the particles are going 500 meters per second and they're all helium atoms and so it's an infinitely thin spherical shell. No, of course they're not all going the same speed. There's some distribution. But there's actually more to it than that because it's more than just the distribution in speeds that can cause a thickness of our uh, spherical shell in momentum space. In classical mechanics, it's possible in principle to make a measurement of a speed, say, with some arbitrarily small uncertainty. It's just dependent upon your measurement device. If you get a good enough measurement device, in theory, in classical mechanics, you could measure something exactly. But quantum theory predicts that it's fundamentally impossible to make simultaneous measurements of a particle's position and momentum with infinite accuracy. So you can blame modern physics, okay? And it comes this idea from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So since it's physically impossible to measure simultaneously the exact position and the exact momentum of a particle, right, there's inescapable uncertainties. And these uncertainties don't arise from imperfections in your instrument. No, it doesn't come from the instrument. It comes because a particle is actually not just a particle, it's also a wave. This is the idea of wave-particle duality, and it's the root of basically everything in quantum mechanics, okay? So the fact that we have wave-particle duality leads to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's kind of a bandwidth, if you will, okay? And I have another lecture on that on my Modern Physics channel if you'd like to view it. But stated simply here, the uncertainty in the momentum in the x direction, delta p x, times the uncertainty in the x coordinate for the position, delta x, should be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. The h bar over 2 part comes from the very specific kind of uh, wave packet, okay? And everything else will give a larger uncertainty than that. This is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So it's simultaneously 
it's impossible to simultaneously measure the momentum and the position exactly. If, for example, you measure the position exactly so that delta x was zero, then delta px would shoot through the roof and vice versa. Now, this would also apply independently in the y and z directions. So you'd have delta pz, delta z greater than or equal to h bar over 2, for example, in addition to your x-coordinate uncertainty. Now, this is the justification for the thickness of the sphere in momentum space for an ideal gas, even if you have just one particle, okay? So even if you have just one particle and do your absolute best to measure its position and momentum at the same time, it will still have a certain thickness to that sphere in momentum space because not having that thickness would violate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and you can't do that. All right? So the shell in momentum space, even for just one particle, is going to have a thickness that we can say is roughly the same as Planck's constant here. Remember that Planck's constant H um, is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 um, in SI units. Okay, so it's a thin shell to be sure because Planck's constant isn't very large, but it does place a lower limit. Now, as you increase the number of gas atoms, there's going to be a natural thickness to the shell as well because not all the atoms are going to be going at the same speed. So there's a couple of contributions here. But now let's take this all back to the whole point of today's lecture. We want to have an expression for the multiplicity of an ideal gas. This means that we're trying to describe the total number of possible ways to describe the atoms of an ideal gas that's in a specific macro state. When I say macro state, I mean describing it according to the macro scale, macro scale variables like pressure, volume, number of particles, temperature, things like that, okay? Now, if we're trying to describe an ideal gas, this means that we're trying to describe all possible configurations of the individual gas atoms position and momentum. That's gonna be a big number, okay? <laughs> now, we'd expect this number to get even higher as the volume of the gas occupies gets larger, right? Because that means there's more places to put things. If you have more volume, you've got more places to put your gas atoms, right? And that means that your multiplicity grows. So one argument that we could say is, okay, we don't know exactly what our multiplicity is, but we know it should be proportional to the volume of the container. Great, step number one. It would also make sense to assume that the multiplicity would be proportional to the volume of that sphere in momentum space. Huh? So if you have a larger momentum space sphere, then the multiplicity would go up too, right? So now we can say it's proportional to two things, the volume and the multiplicity would be proportional to the momentum space volume. Well, that kind of makes sense, and there's a symmetry there. We've got our spatial volume and our momentum space volume and the multiplicity should be proportional to both. Now, let's talk about just one atom for just a second. We're gonna say the multiplicity of a system with just one atom should be proportional to the volume that that atom is occupying and the momentum space volume that it's occupying. So, in a hand-waving kind of way here, remember I've got that omega is proportional to symbol, so this isn't an exact equality, but the volume times the momentum space volume would be roughly the three spatial coordinates, x, y, z, times the three momentum space coordinates, px, py, pz. Now, in your text, Schroeder's Thermal Physics, it's argued that x and px would be limited by the uncertainty principle, right? So you'd have their own uncertainties for x and px. x would have the uncertainty associated with it from the uncertainty principle of delta x, and px, for example, would have delta px. And that would mean that the number of different positions, if you will, would be x divided by delta x, right? So if you have a range in one dimension of x, and then there's an uncertainty to each one of those of delta x, then if you take x and divide it by delta x, then that's the number of places you can put it in x. And then you can make that same argument for px. If you have a certain momentum space range in px, and then you divide it by the uncertainty, delta px, then that's the number of places you could put it in momentum space, all right? So it's important to remember here that you're looking for a multiplicity or a number of possible states here, right? It can't be infinite, it can't be infinite. So we're shooting for something that's big, but finite. 
So omega should be proportional to the volume in regular space x, y, z, divide, uh, times the volume in momentum space px times py times pz, divided by the uncertainties associated for each one of those things, delta x, delta y, delta z, delta px, delta py, and delta pz. Okay. Now, that proportionality on the bottom bit there, remember our Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle said that, for example, for the x direction, delta x times delta px was greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So let's just go ahead and say that delta x times delta px would be proportional to h. All right, we're going to do that. Make sense? Because, you know, h bar is um, h over 2 pi, and then we're dividing that by 2, but on the order, we're getting something around h. And remember, this is just a proportionality here. We're just trying to get a, a guess at what the multiplicity would be. We do the full derivation in chapter 6. So right now, we're trying to get a conceptual handle on it. So delta x times delta px would give us something that's about h. Delta y times delta py would give us about h, and the same for z. So that means on the bottom there, we've got h cubed. Okay. So omega would be proportional to x, y, z, px, py, pz divided by h cubed. That's the volume in regular space times the volume in momentum space divided by h cubed. Hey, that's one atom, and the units even kind of work, right? The units work. So good. We're on the right track. Now, if you add more atoms, remember, that was just for one atom. If you add more atoms, what you do to get the total multiplicity is you multiply the multiplicities, okay? So if you had two atoms, for example, it would be proportional to v times vp divided by h cubed, and then times that again, v divided by vp divided by h cubed. But here's where the idea that you can't tell one helium atom from another comes in, right? If I have helium atom A and helium atom B, uh, they're both helium atoms. It's not like they have different tastes or, you know, different hats, okay? They're the same. So the order doesn't matter. If I have one here and one here and I switch it, it doesn't matter. So what I can say is the multiplicity would be proportional to one-half times those two quantities, right? So omega total would be, for example, proportional to one-half times omega A times omega B, okay? Because you can't tell them apart. Now, we're not just going to have two helium atoms. We're going to have some big collection of helium atoms. So let's say N of them, okay? Capital N. If you extend the logic that I have here and talk about the multiplicity for N helium atoms, then... Remember, the factorial is associated with order. If you want to take the order out of it, right, then you're going to divide by that n factorial. Because since all helium atoms are the same, it doesn't matter how we line them up. So now we have a 1 over n factorial out front, right, times the volume in regular space to the nth power times the volume in momentum space to the nth power, <clears throat> right? Okay, now... Here we go. Let me show you what I'm doing here in this last step here where I have this square root of 2nu. Remember that the volume and momentum space is px times py times pz. So that's our volume and momentum space. All right. Now, remember that for an ideal gas, there is no potential energy measured between the particles. So the total internal energy u would just be equal to the kinetic energy for a particle, which would be p squared over 2m. So if p squared over 2m is equal to the internal energy for that particle, then I can rearrange and solve for my momentum, which would be the square root of 2 times the mass times the internal energy for that particle. Okay, so that's where the square root of 2mu comes from that expression. Now, on average, our three directions, px, py, and pz, would be the same magnitude. And so I take that px, py, pz bit, and I cube it, right? And then there's n molecules, so it's raised to the n power. So it's the square root of 2mu to the 3n, okay? Okay. Now, for each one of those, we have h cubed per particle, and then there's n particles. So on the bottom there, we have h over 3n. So this makes our multiplicity for n particles proportional to, not equal to, okay? but proportional to 1 over n factorial times v to the n times the square root of 2mu to the 3n divided by h to the 3n. All right? Now, this is very hand-weaving. I understand that, okay? 
but I promise we're going to come back to this in chapter 6 once we've done a little bit more work developing some of the fundamental thermodynamics that you're going to need to understand the derivation of the full multiplicity for an ideal gas, okay? But we've got a little work to do before you can understand the full thing, and so this is the hand-waving one so that it'll get us through the day, all right? So, to quote your textbook, Schroeder, the formula for the multiplicity of an ideal gas is a mess, and it is. You'll see it later. It's called the sacker tetrode equation, and it's a mess. But its dependence on the internal energy U and the volume V is pretty simple. Okay, now that's a true statement too. So what he's going to say is that our multiplicity for an ideal gas, right, with internal energy U, volume V, and N particles is equal to some function of N, which we're not going to get into right now, F of N, right? This is left to your imagination for now times the volume that's occupied to the nth power, right, times the internal energy to the 3n over 2 power, all right? So this is what we're going with for now for the expression for the multiplicity of an ideal gas. Now, it may seem that this is very vague and hand wavy. okay? I promise we'll do the full thing later. You'll get your sacro tetrode in, no worries. But we can use it to do a couple of interesting things. So, for example, you probably heard someone say this at some point if you were in a physics class, or maybe even if you just like bad physics jokes. Have you ever heard this one? The ubiquitous volume problem in ideal gases, right? Ubiquitous, by the way, means ever-present. You may have heard the question, you're standing on the right-hand side of a large lecture hall. What is the probability that all of the gas in the room will spontaneously move to the left-hand side of the room, leaving you to suffocate or die of asphy asphyxiation? You might have heard that question. And then somebody will crack, oh well, in thermodynamics everything is equally probable, so if you waited long enough, this might happen to you, right? Okay, we've all heard it before. But how likely is it really? All right, so here's my total multiplicity. The function is some function, f of n, a proportionality, right, times the volume to the nth power times u to the 3n over 2. So what would happen if all the gas moved over to the left-hand side and none of it on the right-hand side was occupied? Well, that would mean that suddenly the volume goes down by half. So instead of v to the n, we'd have v over 2 to the n. So our left-hand side multiplicity would be f of n, v over 2 to the n power times u to the 3n over 2. Now, our total multiplicity is here. This is our left-hand side multiplicity. Remember, to get a probability, what we do is we take the multiplicity of the thing that we're interested in and divide it by our total multiplicity. So, the probability would be omega of all the gas on the left-hand side divided by omega total. So this would mean that we would have f of n, v over 2 to the n, times u to the 3n over 2, and then divide that by f of n, v to the n, u to the 3n over 2. Okay, well, most of this cancels out. And the only thing that we're left with is 1 half to the nth power, and that's our probability. Now, this might seem like not a big deal to you if you've only got three particles. Then you have a one-eighth chance of all the particles moving over to the left-hand side. But you don't have just three particles, do you, right? I mean, you're going to have a mole of particles, or several moles of particles, or many, many moles of particles, right? And so what would happen then is that n is now raised to, say, 10 to the 28th power. Well, that's a really tiny probability, right? So for a reasonable number of particles, for an actual gas, the probability is vanishingly small that they'd all move to the left-hand side and you'd suffocate. Hey, and if there's only three gas molecules in the room, you're going to suffocate anyways. So why worry about the left-hand side? Okay, I'll stop there for now. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. And otherwise, I'll see you in class.